Old things have passed away. What old things? Walking in the flesh, living according to the flesh, living unto the flesh. Passed away. They're dead to me. I have in baptism demonstrated outwardly, but in my heart and mind, actually dead to my flesh, dead to that old man, dead to the lust of my flesh and the pride of life. I am alive in Christ to glorify Christ, to be pleasing to him and to be used by him however he wishes, wherever he wants, with whomever he wants, however he wants, because I am his. Behold, all things have become new. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, that account of sin would still be ours and we'd still be under the ministry of death. But in Christ Jesus, not so. We're a new creation. A new creation in whose image? God's image. Verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Because they refuse, first of all, the light that shines that shows them their true condition. And the light that shines that shows them the only solution is not sacrificing animals and is not the rituals they go through, but it's in Christ. All of those rituals, every last one of them was to point to Christ. Even the instruments he gave them were to point to Christ. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Understand, these terms are very carefully written so that you understand. When one turns to the Lord, so if you have been rebelling against God, and you turn to the Lord, your veil is taken away. He doesn't say you put your veil off. Your veil is taken away. The verbs imply, unstatedly so, it's taken away by someone or something else. When you turn to the Lord in repentance, confession, and surrender. It is the Lord that takes the veil away. It is the Spirit of God, the ministry of life, the Holy Spirit that takes the veil away, and you now are looking at the light of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, and you are given that life by the Holy Spirit placed in Christ, and that veil is taken away. That's another metaphor for being born of the Spirit, not of man. Same thing that Isaiah said, yeah. Yeah, understand, I'm going to take you through an exercise today that's going to be quite interesting to you, I think. But if I was really to take the things we've read today and spend the what I would consider to be the fullness of time doing it, we'd be here for three months. Absolutely. Okay, and, and still may not cover it all. I'm going to just try to wet your whistle today to get you to do these things. The purpose is to shine light on it so that it will excite you and drive you to this same kind of endeavor. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. In other words, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. We already established who's the Lord? Christ Jesus. He now says the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We sing a song like this from Jeremy Camp. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. We sing at the end of the song. Liberty and freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from what? From death. From Satan. From sin. This is the very reason why Romans uh, five and six, really four, five and six, and he culminates it in six. He says, having been set free, why would you go back into that slavery again? Why would you do that? Do you not know to the one you present yourself, that one slave you become? You've been set free in Christ. 
Don't go back and become slaves to the devil and sin again and death. Don't do that. What is veiled? What is veiled is two things. The first thing that's veiled is the very thing that Moses represents. The letter, the ministry of death, your true condition. Obscured. No. In the, well, it's, not able to, it's not that you're not able to understand. It's too shocking for you to want to receive. So you want it covered. In other words, people need to get the reality of how despicable they really are apart from Christ. How disgusting we really are apart from Christ. And that's what people don't want. Please don't tell me how disgusting I am. I really don't want to hear it. Please don't tell me how awful I am. I really don't want to hear it. No, you need to hear it. That's what people want to cover. I'm not that bad. No, you're horrible apart from Christ. You're evil apart from Christ. You're wicked apart from Christ. You're hateful apart from Christ. You need to know these things. That way you'll turn to Christ. Your only hope of not being evil and wicked and dark and corrupt and dead. And what people would rather do is put the veil over it and say, it's not that bad. I disagree. I don't want to, I don't want to agree with it. Yeah, people read the Old Testament just for learning about history. They're not reading the Old Testament for the purposes God really wants them to. There's nothing wrong with learning what the historical information is, but that all by itself takes you nowhere. So the veil is put on by the hearer, not by anyone else. The veil is personally... Put on. In this case, it was the children of Israel that says, oh, that's too bright. Cover that up. And so Moses put a veil on. That's them putting it on themselves. And they said, it's too bright. We don't want to see it. So they wanted the veil on. And Moses put the veil on as an accommodation to also teach us this story. To help us to understand what the reality was of going on that the people weren't just going, oh my gosh, he's weird because he's, he's luminescent, you know, tone that down. It was, no, don't show us how rotten we are. Don't show us how evil we are. Don't show us how corrupt we are. Don't you know? We were just rescued out of Egypt. We are God's people. We are the chosen. We are special. Don't show us our true condition. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to see that. God says, no, I did rescue you. I did bring you out here to show you this so that I can give you life eternal. And they said, no, thank you. Anybody who does not want to hear that truth puts a veil on. Mm-hmm. Great question. How does somebody how does somebody go from having the veil they've put upon themselves by refusing the light of God, first the ministry of death and then the ministry of life, they refuse this, put a veil on it, how do they then become unveiled? They go to the scripture and a strong wind blows it. Well, that's a nice metaphor, but... Yes, so the answer is you then need to convince them of their need to remove the veil, to have the veil removed through their own humbling of themselves and repentance, confession, and commitment to the Lord. That's how the veil is removed. So what, why, this is why he says a bit earlier, he says, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Great boldness of speech. What is he saying? What is the message we're primarily bringing? What was Jesus' first message? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Guess what he's telling you simultaneously? You're wicked. You're dead. You're broken. You're corrupt. You're lost. You're in trouble. Repent so your life can be saved. 
with great boldness of speech. And this is where the, your unloving crowd lives to come. Oh, that's unloving. Well, you think it's more loving to leave the veil on? How bad is that? That's horrible. And these people under the guise of being loving, who have been tricked by the enemy to call something that God has not called loving, they call it loving, calling good evil and evil good here, right? They say, oh, it's more loving to coddle the person. It's more loving to be more gentle with the person. God says, no, shine the light right on them. Ministry of death. Do you not know you're dead and lost in your trespasses and sins? Do you not know how wicked you are? Do you not know how corrupt you are? How dead you are? Oh, no, we just want to love them into the kingdom of God. Stop all that nonsense. The way you love them in the kingdom of God, according to what the Holy Spirit's saying th here through Paul, is through the boldness of speech, first helping them understand the, re the reality of their current condition, which is they're dead and lost in their trespasses and sins, and they are objects of God's wrath right now. And you have to show them this message, tell them this message, and hope that the conviction of the Holy Spirit will be received by that person who is in the process. The Holy Spirit is convicting them at that moment of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that they will, instead of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because they prefer their evil deeds, they will receive the light of the message because you have a twofold message. You are those things, but you don't have to continue to be that because Jesus and you tell them the solution. And this is why verse 18 is so much so important to pay attention to. But we all, with unveiled face, who's the we all? We who are ministers of life, ministers of the spirit. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here's another one of those references. Most people don't get it. They'll just superficially look at verse 18 and say, well, we're being transformed from whatever that image is to whatever this new image is. When the Holy Spirit talks about being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, where's the first reference of image come in? Genesis where? Chapter 2, let us make man in our image. He is intentionally using words to draw you back there so that you will get what he's trying to convey. But we all, with unveiled face, which means we're not going to cover up the glory of the Lord. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. When we look at ourselves, we should be luminescent as if we are the Lord himself. We are not. What we are is the lamp. And what we are is filled with the glory of the Lord, which is why we would shine. And we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, from glory. He's told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there was one glory of one, the terrestrial, and another glory of the celestial. We had the glory of Adam. We now will take on, for if we are in Christ, we will take on the glory of Christ. We had the image of the man of dust. We can take on or we shall have the image of the heavenly man. He's talking about this transformation. And the full transformation does not happen until we put away this tent. That's why we're being transformed. We are not fully transformed at the moment we are born of the spirit. First of all, once we're born of the spirit, we are infants. And we have to grow through maturation. There's much we have to learn that we have even though our sin has been paid for, our paradigm has still been corrupted by all that we've gathered in the world. And the light now is going to shine on that corrupt paradigm for us to put off the things that are not of Christ and to put on Christ. 
all the way up until the Lord Jesus, who can do whatever he wants with whatever is his, makes our terrestrial days come to an end and our celestial days continue on in his presence if we are faithful to him. And that's the final transformation. 1 Corinthians 15 gives a great description of this. Go through that study once again. And he says, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's the quality of what's taking place for those who abide in Christ. It's not built on us. It's not sufficient for us alone or by ourselves. It requires, the lamp requires oil and, and fire in order to be alighted, in order to be a useful lamp. The oil, the Holy Spirit, the fire, Jesus, it requires those in the lamp for the lamp to be a useful light. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart about what anybody else does because we are absolutely convinced of this ministry. It didn't come from men, it came from God. And we are absolutely certain of it, so certain of it, that any one person or collective people's response will not change our minds, will not affect our confidence, which is why we don't lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully. He's now talking about the false teachers and their false doctrines. We put those things off because of the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. We could not take those on. And those who walk in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, the word handling is adulterating. Fouling it up. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, we both show and teach the truth. And your conscience knows whether it's true or not. You may want the veil and you keep it there. But you know in your conscience that God has visited you and that you have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. That's how you can be confident of it, because there is no, oh, they couldn't hear, they couldn't understand. No, no, they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't give themselves to the light of the Lord, and therefore, now they can't. But it starts with they won't. He says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Thou shalt have no gods before me. He can't blind them if they don't make him their God. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God should shine on them. There's that image reference again. He's purposely taking us back to Genesis over and over again. Genesis and Exodus. There's so much information here from the Genesis and Exodus accounts that give us the foundational setting that will never change. Never, ever, ever change. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Here, I think it's incredible, these guys that write lots and lots of books. Who are they trying to promote? Please don't say Jesus, because that's nonsense. Their own pocketbook, their own, their own ministries, they want them to grow and become big and big and big. I can tell you, I came out of one denomination where the more famous a pastor became, he had to split off from the denomination so he could start his own thing. Why? Because he wanted his name and his ministry name to be that which would be more popular. Look, that's no longer preaching Jesus. That's no longer teaching Jesus. That's building your own kingdom. 
Nowhere in the scripture do you find anything like this going on. Nowhere. And as a matter of fact, the, as soon as somebody tried to elevate one of the true apostles, they'd say, that's not about me. It's about Christ Jesus. Stop that. Don't bow to me. Don't extol virtues to me of any kind. Don't lift me up higher than I'm supposed to. I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. And the light you need to listen to and receive is from Christ Jesus. Not me. I'm just a conduit. I'm not sufficient of myself. We do not preach ourselves for Christ Jesus, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God, for it is, yeah, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to that one at the end. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the earthen vessel? Our body. What's the treasure? The light of Jesus Christ. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. The excellence of the power of the lamp is not the lamp. It's the oil and the flame in it. We are hard pressed on every side. In other words, what's our confidence? How certain of this are we? We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So despite being hard pressed, why are they not crushed? Because their sufficiency is in Christ, not in the people, not in their circumstances. When they are perplexed, they do not are not in despair. Why? Because their knowledge, confidence, wisdom, understanding, and light and joy and peace come from the Lord Jesus. Persecuted by people, but not forsaken by God. Why? Because of their faithfulness. Struck down by people, but not destroyed, because people can't destroy them. Can't destroy their ministry. Can't destroy their usefulness to God. They can reject, but they can't destroy. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. This is the dual reality of anybody alive in Christ. You are dead to your old self, but you are also alive in Christ. You are simultaneously dead in one sense to the old lust of your flesh, to the old person. You are alive now in Christ Jesus if you're in him. If you're not, you're just dead. He's saying here, we always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Reckoning yourself to be dead to your flesh. All the way up and until your terrestrial body actually does cease. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in your body. The only way the life of Jesus can be manifested in the lamp is for there not to be other things veiling it, other things uh, suppressing it, other things not allowing the light to shine. Pardon me? It has to actually be oil in the lamp, right? People who claim to have the flame but do not abide in the Holy Spirit, do not live by the Spirit, do not walk in the Spirit, do not trust the Holy Spirit, have no oil. The flame can't have any fuel to be alighted. And so to ask Jesus to be your Savior without being your Lord is no oil. And you think the light can turn on in the lamp without oil. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Reckon yourself dead and alive in and unto Christ Jesus. So then death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, as we continue to do this, not only are we physically getting older and passing on, but we're also being 
hard pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. In other words, attacked by just about everybody, a whole bunch of people everywhere we go. I love it how people say to me, well, you got a whole lot of people that disagree with you. You must be doing something wrong. Since when did that become the measuring stick? Truth is truth, period. Just because the masses reject truth doesn't make truth no longer truth. And truth is, in fact, absolute. I love it when somebody says, there's no absolute truth. Really? Do you have any idea what kind of a statement that is? <laughs> Verse 12. So then death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, we are giving ourselves into the ministry that the Lord God has anointed us to, and that is bringing forth our death. It's going to come not because we're going to reckon ourselves dead, although we do that every day. He's already said that. But we know that means we're going to be put in the way of darkness. We know that in order for us to bring life to others, we have to go into the evil enemy's camp. So by virtue of reckoning ourselves dead, we no longer serve ourselves. Now we serve the Lord Jesus. So what are our orders? Better find out from him. Whatever those orders are, it will never be to keep to yourself and, 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 and not spread it around. That's what he called a wicked and lazy servant. It will always be to go out and be employed. Look at the parable of the talents, the parable of the minas. That's what it teaches. Always to go out and be risked and employed for growth. When you go out among the enemy's camp, in the enemy's camp, among the enemy, you are at risk of the enemy taking hostile action against you. And so therefore, they already reckon themselves dead, so then death is working in us. As we keep doing this, we know what will happen. Same thing happened to our Lord and Savior Jesus. The enemy is going to try to win by killing his terrestrial body, thinking that that's going to succeed. And so we will follow our Lord and Savior in the same way. But by doing that, we bring life to you. And by giving you that light, you receive it, and now life is in you. Does that make sense? And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will, pre will present us with you. In other words, we don't value our terrestrial life so highly that we are unwilling to go serve the Lord the way he commands us to. We've already reckoned that dead. That is not our most valuable possession. Self-preservation terrestrially is not highest on the list. Highest on the list is preservation in Christ. And therefore, we willingly give to him our terrestrial life to be able to use however he wants, with whomever he wants, in whatever way he wants, for the purpose of bringing forth his light into darkness. And the darkness may rebel and may choose to try to kill us. Are we worried? Nope. Because we're quite convinced that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up. So we're not worried. It doesn't cause us apprehension, pause, concern, fear. For all things are for your sakes that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. For all things are for your sakes that grace, having spread through the many. Now he's bringing them back to what they've, he had called them to do earlier being spread through the many. Here, this is the immediate action for them. I called upon you to stand against that man who had his wife, his, his father's wife is uh, in an adulterous relationship. And you, the many, were called upon to bring forth 
that very same message, the ministry of death to that man so that he would turn to the ministry of light. That's the grace of God. The grace of God is the combination of those two being brought forth in the life of those who are walking in darkness. May cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Thanksgiving for what reason? Because the person turns to the Lord and repents and confesses and surrenders, committing himself or herself to Christ Jesus our Lord. And thanksgiving can abound at that point. Thanksgiving for what? Not the person's decision. The grace of God. What was the grace of God that got the person to change their mind? Look, sir, you need to understand you have your father's wife. That is sin leading to death. You need to understand you must turn for this or you will remain an object of God's wrath. And if you die in that condition, you will go to hell and then the eternal lake of fire. Turn to the Lord Jesus. Turn away from sin. Make sure you understand that one path is to death and eternal torment. The other path is to life and eternal blessings in Christ. Pay attention. That's God's grace is the ministry of death that's followed by the ministry of life. And we can give an abundance of thanksgiving, abundance of a number of people and an abundance in amount because somebody turns to the Lord. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Confidence in the... Re the reality of the presence of God in your life, even though you grow older physically, even though you are oppressed more by the enemy, and you may have your terrestrial life modified, if not taken from you, you grow in the Lord day by day, being renewed. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. He's talking about the time we live in this terrestrial body. That's what he's talking about. Because in the light of eternity, in the light of eternity, the amount of time we spend in these terrestrial bodies is hardly even measurable on the radar, on the scale. For our light affliction, notice he calls it light affliction. What did he call it before? Let's see, hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, Struck down, he says, that's light affliction. Some of us get a hangnail and we want to whine our, our faces off. Oh, no, somebody said some bad words to me. Really? Really? Light as in not heavy, as in weight. Not as in luminescent. As in not heavy which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Remember, he has taught us elsewhere, to fellowship with Christ in the sufferings is also to fellowship with him in life, in the blessings. You cannot skip the sufferings and go straight to the blessings. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Where is your focus? If your highest focus is on your terrestrial life from now until it expires, and that is what you esteem highest, that you're going to preserve the most and the greatest standing and the greatest ease and the greatest condition that you can think of for yourself. That is the opposite of what God wants you to do. That's right. Right. Look, very simple basic principle in physics is the law of cause and effect. If we really are Christ's, the effect is we'll live for Christ. So therefore, if the, and the effect reflects the cause. So therefore, if we're not living for Christ, guess what we're reflecting? Whose we are, and it's not Christ's. 
Okay? It's real straightforward, real simple. It's not complicated. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In other words, our highest goal is not to preserve this. That's on Jesus. Look, we're his, and he can preserve us as long as he wants in whatever condition he wants. And he can put us with whomever he wants to put us with in whatever condition we need to go to be able to be in that person's presence. And you know what we do while we're in that person's presence? We don't moan and groan and complain about our conditions. We bring the light of God into the circumstance, in every circumstance, no matter what. For in this we groan, in this tent he's talking about, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Who would not rather have the kind of body that he describes for us that we're going to get to have when we go into the presence of the Lord, when the Lord clothes us again with that body? Of course everybody would say yes. No more pain, no more getting old. We're not ugly anymore. I particularly appreciate that one. All sorts of things, okay? Now listen to this one. Listen to this very carefully. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, do you see the condition? If indeed, having been clothed. So, having been clothed by whom? God. We shall not be found what? Naked. Where's the first reference of being naked? You see, he's on purpose using that term to draw us back to what does naked mean? Naked means you are now dead and lost in your trespasses and sins, and you're aware of it, and you're ashamed. You're embarrassed. My answer, good. That might cause you to turn to the Lord. Good. That's exactly what God did to Adam. He embarrassed him. He shamed him. Made him aware that he was naked. What was the condition of Adam when he was naked? Dead and lost in his trespasses and sins. What did God do? They tried to clothe himself with fig leaves. What a stupid idea. What did God do? Slayed an animal and gave him skins to cover him. God covered the sin, foreshadowing what would happen in Christ. That the death of Christ would be the sacrifice for the sin of Adam and the sin of the world. <laughs> and so therefore, he uses that exact kind of language right here. And if you don't get Genesis chapter 3 and know it really carefully... This makes no sense to you. You'll start fantasizing about what this means at all, and so many teachers do. They'll come up with their own equivocations and metaphors. This means this, and that means that. No, it doesn't. It means the very thing God gave us back in Genesis 3. That's what it means. And he's doing it on purpose. So, in English, our punctuation rules are, if you have two commas in the midst of a sentence, you remove the commas and everything in between them to understand the sentence. And so, in order to do that here, we would say, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our, heavenly habit, with our habitation which is from heaven, if indeed we shall not be found naked. In other words, we'll be closed unless we're found naked. How was Adam found naked? By whom, first of all, was he found? The Lord our God. Which is why when you read the rest of this chapter and he says, we've got to go stand before Jesus in the judgment seat, you understand. Okay? Next is, God found him naked. Why was he naked? Because he had sinned. He was now in the ministry of death. Dead and lost in his trespasses and sins. And the day that you eat it, you shall die and you shall die. 
And he wasn't just talking about physically. He was also talking about immediately the spiritual death that took place. And then also the corruption that set into the flesh and would continue on until the body of sin is done away with. So how was he, what was this, the surrounding information that goes along with having been found naked? It was man who had chosen sin over God's word and God's relationship with him. He preferred the lust of his flesh, the exact condemnation God gives to Adam in uh, Genesis chapter 3, because you preferred the woman over me. You, sir, are dead and lost in your trespasses and sins. Naked. You follow? That's the whole point of why he's using these terms at this moment. Because he is basing his entirety of his teachings, as he has with the Corinthians, on the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. They would know those stories. Why? Because Paul taught them to them. And now he's referring to them for the purpose of giving the foundation for their understanding otherwise. And without that foundation, you cannot understand the rest of the story. So he's not talking about the latter, which you're talking about, that he has a, a potential to go forward and choose to walk in sin. Although you can allude to maybe there's a lower level allusion to this. What he's really talking about is the confrontation of the individual. You're only going to be clothed by God. Look, here's a real popular thing. Everybody who has ever heard of God or heard of church or born in America thinks they're a Christian, right? And that when people die, where do all people go? Well, they all go to heaven. Of course. Right? That's how the answer comes out. In some way, shape, or form. Oh, I loved my daddy, so he must be in heaven. Or I love my mommy, she must be in heaven. Or I love my, I love my son or my daughter, they must be in heaven. Or my sister or my brother, they must be in heaven. Why? Because I loved them. Look, you're clothed by God or you're not. <laughs> you're not clothed by your siblings or your parents or your kids. You're clothed by God or you're not clothed. And it's God that we will stand before in judgment and he will find us naked, which is an indication what? We separated ourselves from God and chose sin. Or we will be found by him. And he'll tell us what that means. Here as we keep reading forward. We'll be found by him in a certain condition whereby he will give us that clothing of eternal bodies that we will be, that are incorruptible evermore. But it's being found by God in this condition and being uh, responded to by God in this condition. And if we have chosen to reject the word of the Lord, because that's what Adam rejected. The reason Adam sinned is because he chose the woman over the word of the Lord. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. In other words, we don't wish ourselves to die, but further clothed. Remember the one glory has the greater glory. These bodies have a glory, but there is a greater glory yet to come that God's going to clothe us with. And we'd love to have that. Not because we want to terminate early our life in these bodies, but because what a glorious thing to want and strive for and desire. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. It's a fantastic choice of words. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. We are absolutely certain. Telling you we have the spirit and living our lives in such a way where you know we have the spirit isn't the same thing. I can come tell you I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean I know you're a Christian. It just means I know you know how to repeat certain words. Any parrot can do that. Showing somebody you are of Jesus, showing whose you are by your words and your actions, being willing to express the entirety of your terrestrial life for the purpose of the glory of God in close, intimate, never departing relationship from Jesus Christ. That's how you know who's Christian and who's not. 
So we are always confident. How come he doesn't say, well, we kind of think so. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In other words, at this time, we don't have the fullness of the transformation that he wants to give us yet. We still live in these earth, earthen vessels. We still live in these earthly bodies. And they are subject to sickness and pain and challenge that we're going to in decay and corruption. And yet in those tents, we go and serve the Lord in the power of God and the confidence of God and the certainty of what Jesus Christ has done, counting on him because the sufficiency is not of us. It's in him. So we're not going to make up some other, gosh, that didn't work. Let me, let me think of some other way to talk to this person so that I can get his or her attention. No. The ministry of death is what brings forth a desire for the ministry of light. The comfort that we've been comforted with was that very thing. God shown the glory of the ministry of death to us, showing us our true condition so that we would turn to him for the ministry of light, which is accomplished fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And to be placed there by the Holy Spirit means we will, as he's about to say, what our response will be. That's how we'll know. Therefore, anytime you see, therefore, you got to know what led up to it. Given these things are true, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. Not well pleasing to me, and quite frankly, not well pleasing to y'all. Well-pleasing to him. Because what I can't control is whether the person will or won't respond rightly. I can't control that. What I can control is choosing who I will serve. That I can control. And therefore, if I am truly serving Jesus, I must be pleasing to him. Let's make it very clear. Any king at this time, if you were not pleasing to him and you ran into his throne room, you were going to go out in at least two pieces. Okay? So, it's important to be pleasing to the king. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what the judgment seat was? To decide whether you live or die. That's the judgment seat. That's a final declaration of what your outcome is going to be. And it's the judgment seat of Christ, not anyone else. Go ask your friends if you're good enough. You're wasting your breath and your time and allowing yourself to be deceived by whatever they're going to tell you. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is the Word of the Lord that shines light on us as the ministry of death and the ministry of light. Are we going to pay any attention? Or are we going to put a veil over that and go off and run and ask our friends? Go off and read popular psychology books. Listen to popular music. Get our identity from others other than the one who's create us, created us, sustained us, and redeemed us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things he thought about in his mind with his good intentions. Is that what God says? Okay, try this. That each one may receive the things that he professed. You see, those are the most common teachings that people want to attach themselves to. Well, I didn't mean to this. Well, I was trying to do good. I asked Jesus as my Savior. Look, he says each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
Thinking produces judgments, judgments produce decisions, decisions produce actions, actions produce habits, habits produce character. Okay? There's no exception to that. Never has been, never will be. And the reason the things that are done in the body are that which are judged is because that's what no one can refute. Somebody's in a, in a court challenge. The evidence is what happened, not, nobody can crawl into the person and say, well, I think what he was thinking was, immediately the attorney say, I object. You can't know what he was thinking, right? The deeds done in the body demonstrate whose you preferred to be, which God you were worshiping. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age, Satan, is blinding people with what? The lust of their flesh. The cares of the world. The higher value of preservation of their terrestrial bodies and the conditions of their current terrestrial lives. This is what people are esteeming higher than valuing life in Christ. What does he say there as he's going forward on his conclusion here now, verse 11? Knowing, therefore, knowing what? Knowing that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what we've done in our flesh, right? Whether, whatever our goods are. It says, knowing this and knowing the terror of the Lord is the next thing he says. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. The wages of sin are death. He who chooses to walk in sin makes himself an object of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is going to be meted out on those who hate God and have not turned to him, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And the wrath of God never ends. Ever. Eternal lake of fire. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. How do you persuade men? Here's the ministry of death. Here's the ministry of light. The comfort I've been comforted with is the reception of the ministry of light because I realize the ministry of death is true. And so is the ministry of light. And I have turned to the Lord, repentance. I've confessed to the Lord, what a despicable human being I have been in being rebellious against him and harming others. And I have confessed and committed to him that I will commit my life to him forevermore. Listening to and following him. So that I don't have to receive the terror of the Lord. But we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences. We don't have to dispute and debate with and battle against these uh, actors who are coming through. Nor does our message need to change just because their message is getting some traction among you. You should be ashamed of yourselves. He says, for we do not commend ourselves again to you. We're not going to sp spend time doing that. That is not necessary. But give you opportunity to boast on our behalf. Why? Because you know who we are. You know what we've said and you know what we've done. That's either a value to you or not. And if it is, you will boast on our behalf. You will say to those false teachers, not so, not so. Holy Spirit told us through Paul the truth. Not so, not so. The Holy Spirit showed us through Paul as he came and he did not live off of so much money that we were going to give him and so much care that we were going to give him. On the other hand, he worked while he was here and gave us the truth and life and did not try to enrich himself. You're here to enrich yourself. That's what he's talking about, them being boasting in him, boasting in them, boasting on their behalf. That you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Just what I just described to you. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. In other words, if somebody thinks we're crazy... We do it for God. So let people call us crazy and lunatics. Who cares? Or if we are found sound mind, it is for you. In other words, if you realize what we're telling you is the truth, that's for your benefit. You realize what we're showing you is for the truth, that's for your benefit. 
If you think we're crazy, we do it for God. We're serving God anyway. And if you don't think we're crazy and that what we're bringing you is sound truth and you pay attention, then you get to be the beneficiary. For the love of Christ compels us, not you. The love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Jesus died in the flesh just like we are to reckon ourselves dead. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live, uh, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. How could it be more crystal clear? As soon as the person says, yeah, but I want, my answer is, so what? Whose are you? Who do you serve? If you keep saying, but I want, but I want, but I want, it's obvious who you serve. And just because you say you serve Jesus, but all of your answers are, I want, I want, I want, all that makes you is deceived or a liar. You need to understand the ministry of death and the ministry of life to have a true and correct understanding of this. And I am going to tell it to you, and I'm going to show it to you at the risk of you persecuting me, at the risk of you pressing in, at the risk of you attempting to crush me, at the risk of being struck down so that you might live. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. That means not even you. We regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, this, is a, this has got two meanings to it. We don't esteem any person in the flesh above Christ. And those who no longer walk in the flesh, we don't account them as that person who did walk in the flesh. That's a really important one because we're back to the subject of that person that was having his, wife's, having his father's wife in adultery and they were to confront him in his sin and get him to repent and turn back to the Lord. When he had his father's wife, he was in the flesh. When he repents and turns to the Lord, he's no longer in the flesh. He's in what? The spirit. We no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. In other words, I'm not going to remember who you were in the flesh when you were walking around in sin. I'm going to regard you now as somebody who's walking in the spirit, which is why we can re-embrace, which is why we can have fellowship again, which is why we need to make sure we communicate to that person that by turning away from his or her flesh and into walking in the spirit, now we're a family again. Now we have fellowship again. Now we have closeness again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Clearly, Christ did come in the flesh, and he has died and risen from the dead, and we don't know him any longer in the flesh. We know him in the spirit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now where is he trying to take our attention to? Old things. He says, now, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Huh? He was referring to the ministry of life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Where is he trying to take your attention back to? Genesis chapter 1. And if you read the book of Revelation, guess what he's going to do there? Old things are all going to pass away, and he's going to make a, another new creation. New heavens, new earth. Okay? Now, he's not giving us the, the key to Revelation here yet, because that's not been given or written. So this reference is back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 and 2. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Guess what that new creation's image was when he said, let us make man in our image, God's image. New creation, image of God. Yes, sir. That was the answer to Nicodemus' question. That's right. 
Old things have passed away. What old things? Walking in the flesh, living according to the flesh, living unto the flesh. Passed away. They're dead to me. I have in baptism demonstrated outwardly, but in my heart and mind, actually dead to my flesh. Dead to that old man. Dead to the lust of my flesh and the pride of life. I am alive in Christ to glorify Christ, to be pleasing to him and to be used by him however he wishes wherever he wants, with whomever he wants, however he wants, because I am his. Behold, all things have become new. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, that account of sin would still be ours and we'd still be under the ministry of death. But in Christ Jesus, not so. We're a new creation. A new creation in whose image? God's image. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at those two things in order. We've been given something and we are committed to something. We have been reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. For what purpose? He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, as his servants, we are to go out and give others the comfort that we've been comforted with, which is the ministry of reconciliation, by showing them the, the ministry of death and the ministry of light. And calling them to turn to the giver of that light, the one who is that light. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, this is the ministry of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or reckoning their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. In other words, God had covered the sins of people. And he came in the work of Jesus Christ not to say, see, these are your sins. You deserve to die. I'm not going to give you any hope. It was God in Jesus Christ saying, despite this reality of you are dead and lost in your trespasses and sins, but I am making a way for you to live. I am giving you an opportunity at life. And if you will hear me, and if you will turn back to me, and if you will trust me going forward in your life, looking to me, the author and finisher of your faith, working out your salvation in fear and trembling, trusting in me with everything you have going forward, your life, your time, your faculties, your resources, everything. If you'll trust me and learn from me, I will show you how to live and give you a job. The job, the ministry of reconciliation that is found in Christ Jesus. And so therefore, verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Or... For he made him who knew no sin, sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why? Because sin had been conquered. And victoriously he rose again from the dead. Having defeated sin, Satan, and death. And therefore we can become the righteousness of God in him. Not just because we are bestowed the righteousness of God, although we are. It's because we now will walk in the light. We will walk in righteousness. We will be pleasing to him. We will no longer live unto ourselves, but unto the Lord Jesus, because he is the source of light. He is the source of life. He is the one who has made us alive and given us the escape from the ministry of death. Now, what do you think is the first place where God gives us the understanding that 
he would send the ministry of life into the world. Genesis, Genesis has a lot of chapters, boys and girls. Where do you think? So, so two answers of Genesis 3. Here's where I'm going to take you back into our study and show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, the thing I said I'd come back to. This is going to be fun. This is hopefully going to pique your interest. This is hopefully going to change how you read the word of the Lord. He says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Genesis chapter 1, verse what? <laughs> well, I think it's verse 2, but 2 or 3. Uh, verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So now, references as you go forward, let me help you with some things. Starting here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. What has he just been talking about? The contrast of the ministry of death and life. The ministry of death, darkness. The ministry of light, or the ministry of life, light. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few other references here so that you catch the whole point of why when God says light be and light was and God saw that it was very good or it was good, he said. And he called, I'll get to the next part, the light day and the darkness night. Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. He had to separate the light from the darkness and called one day and one night. The first place God tells us that Jesus is going to come in the flesh and be the Messiah is alluded to when he says, light be and light was, and it's shown in the darkness. Back from Genesis chapter 1 in the first four verses. Let me take you to Luke chapter 1. It's oftentimes something people don't grasp. But when you look in Luke chapter 1, you have Zechariah's prophecy here toward the end. And in verse 78, he's talking about what God is doing. And he says, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. Day spring. And he called the light day and the darkness night. This is all to purpose to get you to realize what he has taught you in the beginnings of our, our Bibles, the Old Testament, to help you grasp that when God said light be, this was him saying he was going to bring forth the solution of the ministry of death, which was in darkness. He was going to bring forth the life of men in darkness the light of, of God. And that light is Jesus. When we look at other passages, John chapter 3, most commonly known passage in the Bible, 316, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
The light came into the world that through the light we would be saved. The word of God came into being in flesh and and dwelt among us that that light would be the light that would come to us and help us to know the salvation that we would have. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Light and darkness separated. Light, day. Darkness, night. They cannot coexist. You must choose one or the other. This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I don't like the ministry of death. I prefer to have you leave me alone, and I don't know that I'm going to be experiencing those consequences because I prefer to sow to the lust of my flesh and experience temporal or temporary uh, delight. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done in God. These are all references to God saying light be and light was and he separated the light from the darkness and the light was day and darkness was night and the evening and morning were the first day. He starts from the very beginning telling us that darkness is on the face of the deep. What is that? We're under the sway of the evil one. The whole world is. The God of this age is blinding people's eyes, keeping them in darkness. And yet God said, light be and shone light into the darkness. God sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And not choose evil deeds, not choose the darkness, but come out to the light. That the day spring would be the one who would show us that light and we would listen to and follow him for the ministry of life. You see, when you get this connection, It's impossible to think that things like so many false doctrines can exist. It's impossible to even consider that unconditional eternal security is possible because the very first Adam who had the image of God, who walked in the cool of the day with God and heard the word of God, chose the lust of his flesh and God said, you're dead. Not only are you dead, but all of your progeny, all of your offspring are now dead in you. And the only solution to that is the ministry of life. You must reckon that person dead in Adam and alive in Christ Jesus. No longer living to serve the lust of your flesh and be pleasing to yourself because you know you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but you will now walk in the light. You will be certain to walk in the light because you know that by walking in the light, you will be pleasing to him. And being pleasing to him is where you'll get clothed when you go to that judgment seat of Christ. And he clothes you because your deeds are good. Walking in the light. When you understand these connections, when you understand how the entirety of the New Testament is built on the Old Testament, and the entirety of the latter parts of the Old Testament are all built on the former parts of the Old Testament, To attempt to understand the rest of the word of God without having a good, clear understanding of the first five books is a fool's errand. Because then you'll make up any God you want him to be. Despite the fact that he's revealed himself to be a particular God with particular attributes and characteristics that he has demonstrated without compromise since the beginning. And he's a God who never changes. That's why it's so important to send this message so clearly. That's why we're bold to speak the message because we're trying to save people's lives, even though they may turn around and persecute us, even though they might hate us, even though they may press in, even though they may reject us. We don't do it for them primarily. We do it for God. If you think we're crazy, it's for God. If you think we're telling you the truth, it's for you. You decide 
is what he's saying. You see, this is the answer. And so when we understand these truths, we no longer think of those who have been rescued from the ministry of darkness and are now in the ministry of light. We no longer associate with them as people in the flesh, but people in the light, in the life of Christ. We don't continue to account unto them their old self that is dead. We now look at them as that new person alive in Christ, abiding in Christ. And that's how we can be re-embraced all together as one family in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But without that message of reconciliation being carried out by the recipients, you cannot be reconciled with that person because that person is not reconciled with Christ and therefore cannot be reconciled with you unless you make the same choice Adam did and prefer someone else over God. And when you do, you haven't saved that person. You've just shipwrecked yourself. That's very important to understand. Very important to understand. And so that's why we don't compromise our message. That's why we don't water it down. That's why we don't in any way Mix something else with it. Mixing and mingling is just contaminating the message. We have a very simple, solid message. That message will either be responded to favorably by people who are humbled by the true condition that they're in and they will turn to the Lord, or it will be responded to in pride and they will tell you, I'm good enough the way I am. And because I think I'm good enough the way I am, I reject your ministry of darkness, of death, and I reject your ministry of life, and I substitute it with my own. And therefore, I make up the God that I want to worship, not the one who's revealed himself. Part of my hope today was to bring to life the connectivity between what this message is, and it's not just this message, it's throughout the New Testament, to bring to your understanding the connectivity of all of what's said in the New Testament and how it's built on what we should have already learned from the Old Testament. And if we don't see it in that light, then we will make up a whole new God of the New Testament that we like better. And that's what so many people have done because about what we're going to read in the next coming weeks, what God is telling us is going on because the God of this age, one of the ways he is blinding people with the veil, is going to be described in the next couple of chapters. So continue to read forward in 2 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 6. Remember the conclusion at the end of chapter 5 is the same conclusion we ended with uh, when we were finished in chapter, the first part of chapter 3, and that is the comfort that we have been comforted with is the reality of the ministry of death is real, written on the tablets of stone and the wages of sin are death. And because that's who we are apart from Christ, we need the ministry of life by the Spirit of God in the work of Jesus Christ, and we are ambassadors of that message. It is not of ourselves because we are not sufficient enough to save anyone. But their response to that message in reality, knowing that if they are going to receive the ministry of life, they must die to themselves and be alive in Christ and unto Christ to live no longer pleasing to themselves, but to the Lord who saved them. This is the truth of the message. This is the privilege we have. And whoever we know that is not walking in the light that we don't give that message to is an indication we are not confident in that message. Or we prefer something else. We prefer the association with those other people instead of trying to save their lives. We prefer what we have temporarily putting off what's going to happen when we go before the judgment seat of Christ. That's not just dangerous for them. What does 
Jesus say, God will say to lazy and slothful and disobedient servants. Go away, I never knew you. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, we have a choice, but all choices come with consequences. We can either choose to live the life that God wants us to live for his glory and other people's benefit if they will hear. We can choose to live the life that God wants us to live for his glory and other people might think we're crazy. But either one of those choices leads us to life. The other choice to do it our own way, to do what we want with what we have temporarily, to do it our own way, to not trust in the Lord, is to do exactly what Adam did. Prefer someone or something else over fellowship with God. This is why he makes these connections so important for us to know is because that wasn't just for Adam. That's for every human being and will be forevermore. So let's be those people who have that same ministry of light in us, who have that same confidence that he talks about repetitively here, that same boldness that he talks about in here. It does not make you arrogant as the world would want to call you. They might as well call you crazy because that's essentially what they're calling you when they say you're arrogant in your confidence in the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his message and why the liars are liars and the deceivers are deceivers and how you know the truth to be the truth. That doesn't make you arrogant. That makes you exactly what Paul told you by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you're supposed to be. Never thinking you're sufficient in and of yourself, but you're the con conduit. You're the ambassador. And you're taking them to the one who is the light. Does that all make sense? Do the parts all connect well? Is the message clear? Do you see the immutability of God? Never changes. Never has, never will. And do you see how he is speaking to us through the writers of the New Testament, the very same message he gave to us from the very beginning? Let's go be those people. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the Word of God to find out His truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.